I thought we would um, start out our discussion by just seeing what your ideas are about peer review. Um, what do you think peer review is? What does that mean to you when I say that? Really? <laughs> I mean, what, seriously, if I, if I asked you, what does peer review mean? I say, this is going to need to be peer reviewed. What does that mean to you? It's a, it's a sort of revision uh, it's in, a, in a professional manner of reviewing of a, your work or whatever. Okay, it could be a, a revisionary process to, to review your work by other professionals. Mm -hmm. What do you think peer review means? Um, I think it means, yeah, people who know what you're researching are reading it to make sure that it's valid and verify that it's been done the right way. Okay, so there's some aspect of oversight to peer review to you. What do you think peer review is? Um, I think it's another way to get eyes on whatever you're working on so you can start seeing the holes in your research or things that you haven't considered before. Okay, a way to identify gaps in some of the work that's been done. What do you think peer review is? I can't find a, a summary of So a summary? Summary of yeah, the other, other research that maybe has been done in that area. So you, it might be a way to see what's been done and, and what points haven't yet been researched, right? Um, what do you think peer review is? What does that mean to you? Sort of a mechanism to um, test the validity of your work. Okay, right. It's, it's a way to, to look at your work in a critical fashion um, a, of review. Um, what does peer review mean to you? That it means that authorities will have been able to just uh, see your work and see what exactly is happening to it and to give the suggestions to that your work. Okay. Sure. All right. Do you see peer review as a good process, a bad process, something that maybe has upsides and downsides, it's just sort of neutral, doesn't matter? I think it's something that put, because we know that the, the aspect that is peer reviewed is much better, much qualified than the aspect that most people Okay, so you feel it adds something to the process. How do you feel about that? Do you feel like it's a good or bad? Does it have both aspects? Okay, in what way? Like if you have in the same field, things go what's wrong, what you're doing, what you're doing, each of us, or something like that. So they will they came to know what, what, what direction we are working on, or what aspects we are working on. Okay. They may be, and do you feel like that's a good aspect or a bad aspect of peer review? It has a both aspects. So, uh, so it sort of both informs, but maybe you can, maybe you don't always want everybody else to know what you're working on at that time. Okay, that makes sense to me. It brings up intellectual property concerns sometimes, that sort of thing. Um, what do you think about, what's your view of, do you see peer review as a positive, a negative, something that has multiple aspects? It definitely has multiple aspects. I mean, you, you know, you, you're thinking about like a peer reviewed journal and someone else working on something similar as yours, and then they're reviewing your stuff for approval, and then they might not approve it because they want to be the one to publish about it. Sure, so there could be different motivations involved in peer review. Does anybody else have thoughts about peer review? What you think about the process as it exists? It can be slow. It can be slow. It can be something that slows down, what you're trying to do, right? Yes? I think it's, it's entirely dependent on the ethics of the peer reviewers. And if they're following the guidelines that is set forth to them, then it works out great. But when it doesn't, it's disastrous. And maybe that's a question about how objective or subjective the process is, right? And I, th and I think that's a good point. It's a valid point. And um, it's one of the things I think we should keep in mind. I think all of this, I want to talk about it a little bit because I want us to keep this in mind as we go through our discussion. Anybody else have thoughts about this? Um, one of the things that you'll notice, um, you may have already noticed in, in my approach to this topic or my approach to any topic that I'm lecturing on is I want this to be useful to you, right? So it does neither you nor I any good for me to stand up here and talk for an hour and you to go to sleep and then get some credit for it, right? Like, I don't think that's good enough. I think we can do better than that. So I want to speak to this issue in a way that's meaningful to you, that gives you something that, that you can use, right? So 
I have a prepared talk, I have prepared slides, and that's one point of guidance for our discussion. But the main point that I want to use to guide our discussion is what's useful to you. What information about peer review do you want to know? So I guess before we go further, I would ask, are there any questions that people have? Are there any pieces of peer review that you would like to particularly see discussed today? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through um, what I have started and we can sort of revisit um, this discussion and if you have questions or things come to mind and then we'll kind of loop back around at the end and see if maybe any of your thoughts have changed um, with regard to peer review. So if we think about peer review just generally, right, so there are these things that we have very specific professional constructions of, right? It's true in medicine, it's true in science, it's true in the law, it's true in almost any discipline. That we as a discipline project a certain meaning onto a term or use that term in a particular way. And that's true for peer review, but in a very general sense, really what peer review is, if we just look at the dictionary, you're gonna get a definition, something like this is the evaluation of a person's work or performance by a group of people in the same occupation, profession, or industry. So um, I guess I'm curious about the different disciplines represented in the room. Um, how many of you are um, in medicine? Is everybody? Is there anybody who's not? And talk to me about what other disciplines. Are there public health folks? In the room? Okay. Um, do we have basic scientists in the room? Okay. Okay. Who else? Anybody who I, what, what have I not identified? What disciplines have we? Anybody? Anything? Physicians. Pardon? Physicians. <clears throat> Physicians for medicine. Okay. Great. The reason I ask that question is because when I look at this definition, as an attorney, I would say to you that this definition resonates in the definition of the standard of care, right? And so a frequent question for all of us as professionals is did we or did we not meet the relevant standard of care? And how do we determine that, right? And the way the standard of care is typically determined is whether the same type of professional in the same or similar circumstance, would have done the same or similar thing, right? Okay, so we look at this definition, we start to get pieces of that. So it's evaluation of a person's work or performance by who? A group of people. What do you think that's intended to address, that group? Why does it not say by a person? Why does it say by a group of people? Bias. Bias, that's exactly why it says that. So one of the main things we look at in peer review is you want a process as free from bias as possible. And one way you get that is you have a group. It's not just one person says this or that about your work. It's a group review. And there are ways to, there are other ways to guard against bias in peer review. And I want to talk about that a little bit. Okay, so why is it important, I've alluded to this, but why is it important that the people who are looking at this are in the same occupation, profession, or industry? Why is that important? Do you, yes? Are they experts in the field? They have the most knowledge, most years of experience in the field and can offer the feedback to you. Correct, and you want someone with similar expertise, right? So if you're a physician, you don't want me as a lawyer evaluating your medical decision making, right? I don't want you as a physician evaluating my legal decision making, right? Because you need someone who has the relevant professional expertise to make that evaluation. And I would say the industry portion is also important, right? Because to a great degree, especially today, many of us specialize. And so a physician, working in 
pediatric diabetes has a very different practice than a physician working in geriatric oncology, right? And so I think even though this is a very basic definition of peer review from the dictionary, it lays out a lot of very important elements. Now, the, all of these words on the page, which I'm going to selectively um, walk us through, um, pertain to the Louisiana statute that addresses peer review. One thing that is um, relevant is that while states have their own peer review statutes, and most of those statutes are intended to encourage the open discussion of ideas, right? And what else? What else? When we say, notwithstanding any other law to the contrary, basically everything you do in peer review or other associated committees, okay, shall be confidential, kind of in the middle, and shall be used by such committees and the members only in the exercise of the proper functions of the committee, not to tank somebody else's career, not to steal their intellectual property, not to get back at somebody you didn't like, right? Okay. It shall not be available for discovery or court subpoena. And get to yank it into court and take it down to, to argue some cause of litigation, right? For one purpose, not for this purpose. Okay. Except if somebody's staff privileges were affected, right? And they basically think that there was an adverse decision that's related to these records and they can prove up a certain standard of how it works. So, statute goes on. No employee, physician, dentist, public or private hospital organization or institution furnishing information to the peer review committee, right, shall be liable in damages. So, keep for furnishing the information. So, sometimes there's a peer review inquiry and people say, oh my gosh, I'm going to get in trouble for providing you with this information. My colleagues are going to hate me. Nobody's ever going to talk to me again. And I'm going to get sued because somebody's going to run down to the courthouse. Right? And so the statutes are intended to attempt to alleviate some of those fears. No member of any such committee designated in A, the first part that we read, or any entity that sponsors this, so for instance the hospital, is going to be liable for damages. Now, okay, and this is where we get into the piece I said, well, it sort of be, it depends. If such committee member acts without malice, and in the reasonable belief that such action or recommendation is warranted by the facts. So if somebody just has an ax to grind, I mean, malice is a high standard. But if somebody utilizes a, a, what is supposed to be a legitimate peer review process for their own malicious intent, the statute's going to say you don't get to do that. You're not going to get, we're not going to give you the protection of the statute, right? Now you might get to run down to the courthouse and sue somebody for trying to eviscerate your entire career because they just happen to not like you. So when you read this, when I read this and I think about this, what's running in the back of my head is, wow, I mean, these are some pretty hefty protections for peer review process, right? This is a lot of legal protection to say, there are all these things we can do and you can't sue somebody and you can't violate confidentiality and you can't find out about it. This must be really important to somebody. Because I promise you the law doesn't say that about a bunch of other things. But for a lot of other things, it says you can run down the courthouse and you can sue them as many times as you want to. Go right ahead. And we all know that, right? We live in a litigious society. So why protect peer review so strongly? Anybody have any sense of why we do that? They're related to the petroleum industry. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly enough, I came here from Houston, and I can tell you that no, I don't think it is. Because it's a voluntary work? Why else? Why do people think peer review might be taken so seriously? It protects the public from bad practice, whether it's medical practice or legal practice or whatever. I think that's the thing. So peer review is taken so seriously because there is a belief that unless we can have, a, it comes from sort of the um, quality improvement line of thought, all right, that in order to have a space in which people can freely share ideas, 
You're gonna have to protect that space, right? If you want me to walk into a room and evaluate the work, honestly, of a colleague of mine, somebody else who works in my field, then I have to know, I mean, that's a very uncomfortable thing for many of us to do, right? We don't want to criticize some, our peers a lot of times. We don't want somebody's career to be ruined or harmed, and it's our fault. We may feel like, well, we can say what we think about this, but we don't have control over the consequences, and that makes us nervous. So I think for many reasons, people are worried about participating in peer review. And so I think what, what we know is that it's so important that we do this because it's the only way to get to the truth of what happened. I come from hospitals. That's where a lot of my training was. I started out many, many, many moons ago working at the bedside, um, thinking I was going to be a clinician when I grew up. Um, and I think, you know, the OR is a classic example of this, right? If something happens in the OR and you want to get a group of people together and you want to actually have a real, honest, open discussion about what happened in that OR. The only way that's going to happen is if you create a safe space for that discussion to take place. That's what peer review is really intended to do. That's what the protections are intended to do, is to create a safe space so that we can actually get to truth. I mean, that really is the point. Right? It sounds very idealistic, but truly that is the point of peer review, because there is a public good, because we believe that in the public square, people will be better served by science and medicine and law in the petrochemical industry. But engineering in, petro in the petrochemical in industry, this is very much a part of what they look at and what they do, right? There's also, it brings to mind the um, hold the line philosophy, which exists both in the petrochemical industry and in healthcare, of anyone with a concern ought to be able to step forward and say, we need to stop. I'm nervous about this. I don't think we've got it all lined up right. Okay? So that's why there is such strong protection given to peer review. This is, I, I thought it was interesting if we think back in our brain to that simple definition from the dictionary, and then we look at what the AMA has to say about peer review. And when I read this, this reminds me of that thing I said at the beginning, that for all of us within our professions, sometimes we take a general term and we then frame it in a way that it applies to us in a very specific context. And that's what I think about when I read this, because clearly the AMA is thinking about a particular type of peer review, right? A medical peer review is the process by which a professional review body considers whether a practitioner's clinical privileges or membership. So they're not just looking at your work, your publications, your ideas. They are really narrowing this down to saying we're talking about your hospital privileges, we're talking about your clinical privileges, okay? Um, will be adversely affected by a physician's competence or professional conduct. So again, a real narrowing down of this and looking at just really what I would say is a tiny piece of peer review, right? Not looking at the broad base, look, sort of check on the system of your science, right? But are we gonna revoke your privileges? And that the objective of this process is the promotion of highest quality medical care and patient safety. Why is it important? We've talked about this a little bit, but I thought this was interesting from the NIH grants uh, site has a quotation from our president saying, to maintain our edge, so to maintain the edge that the United States has in science, we've got to protect our rigorous peer review system and ensure that we only fund proposals that promise the biggest bang for the taxpayer's buck. That's what's going to maintain our standards of scientific excellence for years to come. So I think there's this sensibility that while peer review may sometimes slow us down, that if we do it right, if we're careful about establishing a rigorous, objective, non-biased system, it really should add value in a very important way to the work that we do. More from the NIH. So this essentially talks about the idea that to get NIH funding, there are two levels of peer review you have to get through. And so the first level initial peer review is an assessment of scientific and technical merit conducted by a scientific review group. The second level is performed by the National Advisory Councils or boards who make recommendations 
um, on priority areas of research, policy, funding. So this just isn't the science. This is what are our policy priorities? What are our scientific priorities? And this portion also involves both scientific members and members of the public who may have an interest in these various areas. The core values of NIH peer review are expert assessment, transparency, impartiality, fairness, confidentiality, integrity, and efficiency. So you can ding them on the efficiency if you think they're not doing a good job because it's in their set of core values. These values drive NIH to seek the highest level of ethical standards. And I think if we remember that, that that's our goal in peer review and we call one another back to that, it's not a punitive process, it's an informative process. It's meant to help us all be better. If we're using it in another way, we're misusing it. And we should feel comfortable calling the cards on that and saying, wait a minute, this is what peer review is intended to do? My sensibility here is you're using this for some other purpose that I don't understand. Let's talk about this. So, I know we don't have a lot of time, um, about five minutes left, but I'm just wondering if you have any discussion, any thoughts, having gone through that part of the discussion about who should be involved, how should it work, what can we improve, what are the pitfalls, how do you address bias, what kinds of things do you do? Um, you can actually go to 430 if you have time. Okay, yeah, I'm fine. So I think that this is, um, what do you think about that? Sort of, I mean, we've talked about the idea that we think people should, somebody said, you know, I think people should be involved who have a significant um, expertise, right? I think there would be maybe another view that says, okay, but, take a radiology study, and we're doing a peer review with that, right? And the person who's read it is your most junior, just out of fellowship radiologist. So maybe you also want somebody on your peer review team who knows what it's like to be the most junior, fresh out of fellowship radiologist, right? Who's, who's being asked to maybe take on a larger patient load or a particularly complex group of patients. So maybe it's important to have diversity in our peer review groups, right? Um, any other thoughts about who should be involved in peer review? How should we select people to be involved in peer review? Yes. Is there a minimal or maximum number of people that you bring to the table for a peer review or? There aren't, although what I would say in having done um, peer review programs is you always, in anything where you have a vote, <laughs> you tend to want to have an odd number of voters so that you can have a tiebreaker, right? Because what you don't want is we have four people on your committee and two went that way and two went the other way and now what do you do? And so you want an odd number um, in your voting group. I think you also want a large enough number to be representative. So I would submit to you, and I hope this isn't highly controversial, but you wouldn't want a group of all men or a group of all women or a group necessarily with only one man or only one woman, right? Or only one member of a particular group. So I think you want diversity represented in a variety of ways. I think you want people who come from various ethnicities, backgrounds. If you have an international practice group, I think you want to make sure that's represented on your peer review committee. You want to have people um, at various experience levels. I think the more diverse you can make your peer review group, the more robust the group will be. Um, I think another thing I would say as a pragmatic matter is if I'm putting together a peer review group and there's someone in my group who seems to fight and argue with every professional that they run into, that's probably not going to be somebody who I'm going to put at the top of my list to be on my peer review committee, right? 
I, I want people who seem to have demonstrated a level of professional respect and professionalism and regard for other individuals because we're about to put that person in a position where they're going to review the work of others. Another point that dovetails who you pick and how the process should work is how do you guard against bias? When I, um, a number of years ago, was asked to set up a peer review program, I think one, the, the issue I think I went after the hardest because it was the issue I knew I was going to be questioned on most rigorously. It was going to be my live or die moment when I attempted to get clinicians to engage in this, right, was bias. Either people were going to believe in the process and they were going to participate, or people were going to completely disengage from the process and say, don't believe in your process. I think it's biased. I don't think I'm going to get a fair shake, and I'm, I'm just I'm going to fight with my feet, and I'm, I'm not doing this, and I'm certainly not doing it any more than I'm required to do. And so I think it's incredibly important that you say, how does this process work? How do you guard against bias? And I have some thoughts, but what do you think? We've had a guy for the last probably five or six years at one of the journals that we submit to. I work in orthopedics, and if we ever submitted anything that involved arthroscopic surgery, and he got it, the, the review that we got back was, this procedure is useless and without merit, period. Didn't matter which journal he was reviewing for, he's, he's mm -hmm. a fairly well-known doctor, and we all know who it is. Right. But it's supposed to be anonymous, but that's what you got. So three or four of the journals that I can think of right off hand, when you submit your paper now, they will say, is there anybody that you want excluded or included on your peer review committee? So that takes that, I mean, they're, they're wasting usually two weeks time minimum. Mm -hmm waiting for him to give his review back, and we all know what it's going to say, so they just sort of go around him now. And you can only pick one person that you want to be on it and one person that you don't. And then how many people total are assigned? Typically five. That's interesting. That is an interesting workaround. And I think it's also an interesting feedback mechanism, right? Because if you have, if nobody wants Bob or Susie or whoever on their committee, after a while, you're probably going to wonder about that, right? Why is that? I mean, if you're looking at that process, you're going to say, wait a minute, nobody wants these folks on their review. Now, you could make an argument that you could say, well, that's because, you know, they're the toughest grader or whatever, right? It, but, but I think it allows a level of feedback. And I think that's one of the things about peer review is that you want layers of analysis, right? So it, it, there's some balance point always in, in everything we do in life between um, not only between the perfect and the good but perhaps the perfect and the functional right and, and so we could have a, a hugely robust process um, but that was so labor intensive that it didn't make sense right alternatively you can have a process where you're just papering over things and you're really not achieving anything substantive, which in any arena I have always thought is a waste of time. Um, so there's some balance point in there, right? But I think some of some of what I think about when, when you talk about that is um, having, um, I think also for the work that people are doing, and there are a couple more chairs up here and there's one over here if anybody wants any of that. Um, Um, you know, I think in the same way that we would say if nobody wants a particular reviewer on their review panel, maybe that's, you know, maybe that says something. I also think one of the things um, that comes up, and there have been a number of public forum discussions, I would say more public forum discussions about this within the past few years than maybe ever before, 
um, is the idea of quality metrics for professionals, right? And, and this idea that, look, um, everybody is going to sort of draw the short straw at some time, right? You're going to treat the patient where something goes horribly wrong. You're going to have the case where you represent the client where something is horribly wrong. You're going to have the experiment where all your, you know, data winds up cattywampus and, you know, ev you're going to get that every now and then. Everybody, it's that old thing of if, if you never fail, you're not trying hard enough, right? So I, I think there's a recognition that to be at the edge, to be at the top, you're going to have to make some mistakes. We're going to have to have some tolerance for that. But if you're two standard deviations outside the norm of the what everybody, you know, here's the curve for, you know, average number of mistakes, I think we probably want to take a look at that, right? Now, maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe it's a physician who treats patients who are critically ill and closer to the end of life than everybody else in your sample, right? You've got a problem with your sample. There are reasons for that. But when we structure peer review, I think also and when we look at this, if every grant you submit gets kicked back, if every paper you put out nobody wants to publish, at some point there's a question about that, right? And it doesn't necessarily question, say that you're doing something, you know, it doesn't mean that your integrity is impugned, it doesn't mean necessarily even that your work product is, is somehow fundamentally bad, but what it does mean is that there's some standard out there that you're being asked to meet that somehow you're not meeting. And so if that's part of your professional requirement, if that's part of what you need to do to get from point A to point B in your profession, then I think peer review can be a useful tool to look at that. <clears throat> Does anybody else have thoughts about how should the process work? Sort of what do we do now? I mean, somebody said efficiency earlier, and I'm kind of, I think we can flesh that out a little bit. What do we do now that we think doesn't make any sense and we ought to do in a different way? Anybody who? I'm impressed. We do it all really well. I mean, with regarding efficiency, I mean, the, there's some ways I'm not sure how to get around it because you're I mean, relying on people to review this and, of course, there's going to be things that happen in their lives with their job and work that are going to make it take longer. So what do you do besides, you know, try to set some deadlines? I'm not sure. Well, I think from the standpoint, so what I would say is the, there are efficiencies that have to do with somebody's reviewing a paper and how long does it take to review the paper? To kind of go to that. Right. But then there are efficiencies that are systematic efficiencies, which maybe to me was a little more of what you were touching on, where sometimes you encounter a process, and some of what you're touching on also, that's broken. And you can encounter that in a one-off sense, right? I have this particular review committee I have to deal with, and it seems like there's a problem with that committee. But you could also say systematically, what's the oversight? Right? Do we just set up all these things and say, whatever everybody says, okay, that's fine? Or is there some level of oversight to, to somehow evaluate scientifically the integrity of, of, of these bodies? And, or, or, you know, how do, we keep, how do we keep things from running amok? I don't know that this has been particularly well worked out. I would say it probably hadn't been particularly well worked out. I think we, um, but I'm curious if people have ideas about it. Subject of future research. Okay. We've talked about this a little bit, but the potential pitfalls. Does anybody have any thoughts about that, about how you might, what you might perceive as the pitfalls if you were, if peer review were being conducted and you were the person whose work was being reviewed or if you were asked to sit on a committee that was reviewing work and are there contexts in which you feel more or less that way? Are you, is there a sense that, well, if I'm asked to review a journal article, I'm a little more comfortable with that. If I'm asked to sit and walk through what happened in the OR or walk through somebody else's bench work in the lab, I'm less comfortable with that because that feels more personal. 
Is there any sensibility around the different types of issues that might affect peer review in different contexts? Yes. Sometimes these pitfalls are never ending, like especially in research grant proposals. Like you send grant and it's reviewed by a set of panel, and you revise and send it back, they change the panel. <laughs> you you fix those first pitfalls, then they ask new panel, ask you some new things. Sure. So, right. So, yeah, so. I agree. <laughs> right. It can just be it can be sometimes difficult to anticipate. Next steps in the process. What are what are people going to continue to want? Because if uh, review is this especially for grant proposal, uh, peer review uh, are the same reviewers who are reviewing your grant or paper. If in the journal paper, usually they are the same ones when you send back, but in the grant review process, they change either all or some of them. You know. And then that can then that can be hard in the process. Anybody else have any thoughts? And the other thing is the standard, like your peer reviewers may be very highly expert in that area, you know. And you are like a postdoc or fellow or early career, your research may not be at that up to the that standard in the journal or mm -hmm. or like a grant proposal. I think that's true. And I think and I think it's also um, I think it's highly variable in a number of ways, and, and that's one of the ways in which it's highly variable. Yeah, I think you also might run into um, some conflict of interest um, issues. Um, you know, somebody who you know or you worked with or published with, and then you're reviewing that work, um, and then second, your your ability to review the work. So if you're an, an expert in leukemia, for example, does that mean that you can review any leukemia? Paper because it might involve uh, heavily by statistics, for example, and there's some, you know, right. sequencing or I don't know, formula, big formulas or the huge analysis that you might not be familiar or comfortable in analyzing. So this is another also very over. You can I say I can true. I can review this part but not this part because I, I might need to consult the device decision or I you know. Right. Well, I think that's true, and I think so. I think you bring up some points we haven't discussed yet, um, and and I certainly think, for instance, that's an example of how robust is the process, right? When the reviewers are selected, so I think there are times when reviewers are selected, and the person being reviewed may think, well, "That's not a fair panel for my work because I I have this um, you know data." where the statistical analysis is very complex, very sophisticated, and I know the work of the, the people who sit on this committee, and they don't know anything about what I'm doing. And, and whose bright idea was that? You know, I mean, and, and so I think there is that. There are times, I think, when, um, when you talk about conflicts of interest, um, and I think there's this, there's, there are different things, but there's some blend conceptually between conflicts of interest and bias, right? What do you do when you submit something for publication and the review that comes back really seems to be much more about the reviewer's opinion about the state of matters in the world relative to that than about the science, right? What are you supposed to do with that? Um, I think also, Although there are required conflict of interest disclosures and those have gotten more stringent over time, I think there are still concerns that there can be conflicts in the process that aren't identified. And sometimes, quite frankly, that you wouldn't have any way of knowing, right? Because where it's anonymous, it's very difficult then to, um, to make that determination, right? And so, Transparency is something that can work in a number of ways. So, so you could say, well, you know, I think the idea of one of the ideas of having the reviewers be anonymous sometimes is to say, well, we don't want them to suffer any retaliation, right? And certainly none of us would want them to suffer any retaliation. Um, but alternatively, it exposes on the other side of the coin this, right? How do you know the person has the expertise? How do you know they don't have conflicts of interest? 
And absent a really rigorous and transparent standard that says, look, we recognize that these concerns might exist and who's appointed on the review committee. And therefore, we, the organization appointing the review committee, assert that when we put someone on the review committee, this is what we screen them for, and this is what we will represent to you that they will bring to the table. And if at any time in the process you have a question about whether they have these things that they do actually bring to the table, you can ask us about that. And we're not going to reveal their identity, but we are going to say, yes, this person has this experience, or no, they don't, but this other person does. And I don't think we have reached that level of sophistication in our peer review groups for the most part yet. Yes. When you submit something, whether it be to a journal or a committee, you usually can attach notes to that submission, mm -hmm. and so you can request that. I mean, I, whether your requests are actually met, that's that's on the review committee. But a lot right. of times, you know, when I submit stuff to Journal of Military Medicine, you know, I'd like somebody who works in, uh, and for that journal, you can click like what you want, you know, like post employment health. Um, combat conditioning, exercise physiology, stuff like that. And that way, they, when they go out and try to find reviewers, they look for those categories. Right. No, I think that's true. And there are a number of times where you do perhaps have more say in the process right. than you might realize. And I think that's important to remember. I think that's actually true for any number of things where you may feel like, well, there's just a preordained process and I just have to do it this way. Mm -hmm. But any number of times, there actually is some recourse within the process. Um, I think, again, we've talked about this a little bit, but we've talked about the fact that bias is a problem. I don't know that we've talked about, well, what do you do about it? How do you address bias in terms of peer review? We all realize it's an issue, but what do you do about it? Pardon? Right. I agree. I agree. I think oversight is something that really helps with bias. Um, I think um, transparency standards where even if you don't have transparency as to identity, you have transparency as to a set of standards that are being adhered to, right, and actively represented relative to that circumstance, not just a, a broad umbrella. How else can we address bias? What do you think? I think the main thing in, so you all can help me out and you can tell me what fancy research term I'm forgetting relative to this, but, but there's this idea that as you run more and more experiments and you collect more and more data, you're going to get closer to the reality of what you're looking at. Right. In other words, you might run one batch of data and it comes back and it skis really heavily in one direction and you think, oh my God, look at that, that's so cool or that's awful or whatever, but I've really got something there, right? But by the time you run 10 more batches of data, that thing that was sitting out here looking like you really had something, it, 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 turn, it comes, sort of comes out in the wash, right? It, and, and so the idea that the more data you run, the more um, information you have, the more points you have to plot, the closer you are to the reality of what's actually going on in a given situation, right? Do I make sense even if I don't manage the correct term on this? I can't think of what term I want to use for that. But. So I think the issue becomes one of balance because I think one of the ways you really fix bias is through having more data. But the problem is having more data and having more oversight leads to a process that takes longer and requires more to resource, right? So we're always in this, I think, push-pull place of trying to have enough oversight, enough layers of review, enough points of data to make a good decision, but not so many as to hamstring the process. And I don't know that anybody's got that worked out, but I do think that's um, a key point of tension. And somebody could probably run some analysis of this and sort of figure out where the tipping point is, right? Where, where you hit the line of diminishing returns. 
so that you're you know you're putting in more resources and more research not really getting anything more out of your peer review process um i i think um we've touched on this a little bit and it, it's interesting to me i think this is um um the last slide but one of the things i i will bring up to you and uh, and I'm happy then to, to kind of take the discussion um, wherever you'd like or we can call it a day um, is not so much in the scientific journal review process although you do see that I, I have seen it there but in the peer review processes where people are more are being asked to review um, the work of other people in their own group. I think so if you so I, I think that there can be a lot of feelings that people have around that that aren't particularly easy. We don't usually acknowledge and we sure don't give people much of a, a, a structure for dealing with. Right. So I think in terms of journal reviews, there are sometimes these issues that both of you have brought up around sensibilities that particular review groups on some level aren't very good. Their, their, their process is somehow flawed or their product is flawed. Right. Um, and, and I think that that absolutely happens and it can be really frustrating. Um, and I do think sometimes some of that can very much feel like it's becoming personal and maybe is personal. Um, so I don't want to, to pretend that that dynamic doesn't exist in that world, because I think it does. But my sensibility around at least the piece of work that I've done in this is that it sometimes exists in that world, but it frequently exists in the world where you are, if you are asked to review the work of your colleagues in some sort of departmental or institutional setting where there's some sort of internal peer review process, that that's really hard for people. And it, that it's hard for everyone. It's hard for the person being reviewed. They feel like they're being judged. They feel like um, not only are they being judged in that moment, but that whatever formulations people construct around this are going to stay with them. These are the people who potentially they're going to work with for the rest of their careers if they stay at that institution. And, and they really can feel like this is something that's, that's going to be very difficult for them from an, both an emotional and a professional standpoint to manage in their career life, right? And I think it can also be very difficult for people who are asked to review the work of their peers, where you're talking about sort of an in-house, if you will, peer review system, right? People think, I want to do a good job, and this is important to me, but I work with these people. I, 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 I don't want them to be put in a bad position. I wouldn't want to be put in that position. And I find that there, are, and yet, and yet, I think we all realize it's so important to do this work, right? None of us want, um, none of us want substandard work being done in our fields that potentially harms people, right? None of us want that. And yet, what I would submit to you exists for a variety of reasons, but I think in no small part because of some of the human dynamics around this, is that in any department, in any thing you could ever think of, you, you could go into an orthopedic surgery department, you could go into a radiology department, you could go into a leukemia department, you could go into microbiology lab, the epi folks, attorneys of every stripe, and you could say, if my mother were coming to your group for X, who should she see? And I would submit to you that in many, many, many of our groups and many, many, many of our disciplines, there will be an answer not infrequently, too frequently, in my opinion, that goes something like this. We have an amazing group of professionals. Your mom could see anybody at all except don't let her see X. 
right? God help us all. Don't let mom see this person. So why do we still have that person in that role? Right? Why haven't we done something about that? Why haven't we helped that person? Why haven't we educated that person? Why haven't we said, you know what? We love you. You're a great person, but there's a standard that needs to be met. And we want to work with you. We want to help you meet the standard. But there is going to be some accountability. And at some point, if you're not able to meet the standard, then we need to talk about maybe something else that might work better for you. Because I'm sure you don't want to do work that doesn't meet this standard. And we certainly don't want to have work that doesn't meet that standard. And I think it is a challenge to all of us <laughs> as individuals and in our professional roles to figure out how to better navigate that and to figure out how we reach a system that's fair and just and human and humane. that doesn't wind up with saying, well, mom can see anybody but this person. And I think we should all know that as long as that's what we've got, we have a fair bit of work to do. And the place where a lot of that work lives is in peer review. So that's what I have for you all today. You've been fabulous to, to talk with and work with. And um, I'm here. I'm happy to talk more with you or answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Does anyone have questions for Laura? They're ready to get. All right. Well, <laughs> uh, just another reminder uh, to sign in if you haven't done that, please. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.